Uh, I'm Wei Xiong. I'm professor here. It's my great pleasure uh, to, uh, to moderate the last session. So this is a session on monetary, physical, and the macro prudential policies and the long-run structural challenges. Really, there are lots of exciting issues to discuss. After Ben's uh, conversation earlier, we know the world is much calmer than a few years back. But still, we have a lot of problems. Uh, US still has a, a high debt level. And uh, the world, actually, many countries face uh, demographic problems and uh, lots of government debt uh, uh, everywhere. So, so these are the issues we're going to go over uh, in this session. Uh, we have three uh, leading experts uh, on these issues. Uh, let me uh, briefly uh, uh, mention uh, all of them. Uh, Annette uh, Vincent Jorgensen is currently a senior advisor at the Federal Reserve Board. Uh, before uh, the current uh, position, she has been to uh, many universities. Uh, UC Berkeley, uh, and Northwestern, and the University of Chicago. Uh, she has done a lot of insight, uh, insightful work on, on debt financing and, uh, and uh, inflation and monetary policy. Um, uh, our second speaker is Hanno Lustig, who is a finance professor at Stanford University. And uh, he's a, a leading expert on uh, debt financing, on you know, uh, fiscal uh, uh, sustainability, and he, he has uh, uh, been running a big debate on, the, on this issue uh, he, 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 he will cover today. And the last we have uh, Thomas Philippon uh, from uh, uh, NYU Stern School, where he's a finance professor, and Thomas is a leading expert on banking, macroeconomy, and uh, many other issues. I know he has a lot to say today, and he will cover all of these uh, issues. <laughs> so without further ado, let's uh, have Annette to just kick off the session. So I, I uh, use him an academic. As I said, and then now I work for the Federal Reserve, and then one advantage of that is that you sort of get the questions a little bit before everyone else, and you hopefully have enough time to work on them, uh, to put something out there, get feedback, and make sure the policy doesn't go awry. So I very much look forward to your comments. Okay, well today I want to talk about quantitative tightening, which is obviously one of the, the top items on the Fed's agenda. To the left, you'll see, you see the Fed's assets. In black is the Fed's total assets. Uh, it goes up a lot more than it goes down. There's been a lot more QE than QT. Nonetheless, the Fed has succeeded in doing a bunch of balance sheet runoff quantitative tightening since the spring of 2022. Uh, that has been due to both a reduction in the Treasury holdings, that's the red line, as well as in the MBS holdings, that's the blue line. On the liability side, the right picture shows the total liabilities. Of course, those are equal to the to total assets. The main liabilities, just to remind you, is cash or currency, that's the blue line. And then bank reserves, this is just bank deposits with the Federal Reserve. Uh, there's also been a role played for the overnight reverse repo facility, that's the pink line. And that is basically the Federal Reserve doing repo borrowing from money market funds. All right, so the policy question is, the one I want to ask here is, when should quantitative easing, sorry, when should quantitative tightening uh, end? And at first you might think, well, isn't that linked to how much the Fed needs to fight inflation and so it doesn't the need for a particular policy stance dictate how big the balance sheet uh, is. And that was sort of the correct thinking when the Fed was doing quantitative easing, but it's not anymore because now the CO lower bound or the effective lower bound is not binding. So remember, we got into all this stuff because once the short rate hit the CO lower bound or the effective lower bound, we needed more stimulus, and so the Fed increased the size of its balance sheet. But there's no quote unquote, upper bound, right? So if you want to tighten policy, you can do that as much as you want with the short rate. And so I'm going to remind you of that um, a little bit later. But sort of the summary uh, note here is that whenever it's the central bank can pay interest on reserves, as the Fed has since the financial crisis, you can control the monetary policy stance through increasing the IOR. You know, and that doesn't dictate the size of the balance sheet. So what I want to talk about today is we need a criteria a criterion for deciding what to do with the balance sheet when it's not needed to stimulate the economy. And so by far the leading one that you hear a lot, both in the Fed corridors and outside the Fed, is that we want to keep a large balance sheet so that there's lots of reserve supply, so there's lots of liquidity supply, so that we don't get another yield spike like we did back in September of 2019. And I'm, I wrote a paper with David Lopez Salida where we calculate at what reserve supply is the reserves market, is liquidity as tight, given today's size of the economy the of the banking sector, as it was then, 
I'm going to calculate a number for you. Lo and behold, this is going to dictate a large absolute balance sheet based on this criterion. On the other hand, I would argue pretty much any other criterion you're going to throw out there is going to suggest a much smaller balance sheet. I'm going to go through a bunch. And then I'm going to focus on one which is basically money supply, but extended to thinking about the supply of not just cash, but reserves. I'm going to argue that you're going to get a much smaller optimal balance sheet based on this. And so my bottom line will be, and let me remember to say that these are only my views. And for those of you from the press, I'm not a governor. I'm just a lowly staff from the Fed. So please don't say that the Fed is doing this out of the other. Um, my personal view is that the Fed should put some weight on the other considerations other than interest rate volatility, and therefore that it may want to tolerate at least some interest rate volatility. I mean, obviously, we're not going for huge yield spikes, but there's a standing repo facility to prevent that. At the end, I'm going to uh, provide a second conclusion, which is that if the Fed was to shorten the duration of its asset holdings, then you will see it's going to emerge very simply that there will be less conflict between these two uh, criteria. All right, so let's go. So basically, I just need to get to one equation, one figure. Then we're going to move around some lines in that figure the rest of the talk, and you'll see it all coming up. OK, so let's think about <coughs> bank demand for reserves. The reserves now is an asset. That's because I'm thinking about a commercial bank, not the Federal Reserve for which the reserve is a liability. All right, so. Reserves have four features that are relevant here. First, uh, the Fed can pay interest on reserves. Second, uh, historically were reserve requirements. Now those are low or zero, actually, um, but just to get that in there. Uh, importantly, reserves have convenience benefits, which most importantly means that reserves is sort of the ultimate uh, safe and liquid asset in that you can, without any transaction cost or delay, immediately satisfy a deposit outflow if you have reserves. So, I'm going to capture that with a convenience value function V, which you can think of as the expected cost savings from holding reserves to satisfy those potential deposit outflows with, uh, with reserves rather than something else. And an important uh, item here will be the derivative of that V function with respect to ad additional reserves. So what is the margin value of, more of it all or more reserves? Uh, this is going to be declining in how many reserves you already hold as a bank because you may not need that extra liquidity. <coughs> Just like your own money demand function is declining in how much cash you already have in your wallet. And importantly, it's going to be increasing in the, sort of the size of the banking sector proctored by deposits because a bigger banking sector needs more liquidity. Finally, uh, there's a bank balance sheet cost, which uh, following literature I'm going to model in reduced form as a, a fixed uh, percentage cost of assets. You can think of this as coming from equity capital being more expensive than other kinds of capital and there being some capital requirements. All right, so what is reserve demand here? There's many first order conditions we could derive. We could think about reserves versus other assets. We could think about raising more liabilities to hold reserves. In practice, banks are currently borrowing in the Fed funds market from the GSE, uh, the Federal Home Loan Banks, for example. So I'm going to look at the first order condition for borrowing in the interbank market at the Fed funds rate and holding more reserves. And given these features here, the first order con condition simply says that the highest interest rate a bank is willing to pay to borrow to hold more reserves is going to be the net benefit of doing that, which is the interest on reserves plus the convenience yield minus the balance sheet cost. And out of this comes a sort of very normal looking money demand uh, schedule where the slope comes from the declining convenience yield withholdings. The level is controlled by the interest rate on reserves, and the left right location is controlled by uh, reserve requirements. All right, so now you can see from this, actually, that you don't need a particular balance sheet size. You don't need a particular reserve supply in order for the Fed uh, to have the Fed funds rate hit the target. Because this is a bit of a weird market in that the supplier also controls the demand curve. Okay, so not only can the Fed, you know, like it used to do, do open market operations to change the supply, it can also move the demand curve up and down because it's like Starbucks deciding sort of to sell better coffee, we can make the reserves better by paying more interest on them and increase the demand curve. So that means that, as I started out with uh, saying, we need another criteria for deciding how large reserves uh, should the Fed want to supply when a big balance sheet is not needed for stimulating the economy. OK, so let's start with this interest rate volatility criteria. And, and here is just a reminder of how much yields spiked 
back on September 17, 2019, you see to the left the Fed Fund's IOR spread and to the right the VPO IOR spread and you see large spikes there. All right, so why does it help to have a big balance sheet to avoid these yield spikes? Uh, that's because if you have a large supply, then you can see from the left figure, if there's any sort of supply variation in reserves, which in practice will come because the autonomous factors on the central bank balance sheet could move. That's one liability. If they move, then reserves will have to move in the other direction in order for the balance sheet to balance. Okay, so when, if you have a low reserve supply and then there's some, some fluctuation in supply, you're going to get a large interest rate movement out of that, which you won't if you start out with a high reserve supply, right? Simply because the demand curve is steeper to the left than it is to the right. More subtly, if you look at the chart to the right, if you have horizontal demand shocks, you are also going to get less interest rate volatility out of those if you have a high supply. You know, if you thought about moving the demand schedule out where it's completely flat, you know, if you move it horizontally, it, there's going to be no interest rate volatility. So this is kind of the key argument that's floating around the, the Fed hallways of like, okay, let's just keep a big balance sheet, you know, then nobody will, uh, will get in trouble and everything will be fine. Okay, so. This September uh, 17, 2019 event actually to some extent came as a surprise for the Fed. And I'm graphing in red here. It's the same Fed funds IOR line as before, just now in monthly average data. And then the blue line is reserves to GDP that works on the right axis. And so in the last quantitative tightening episode, which ended in September of 2019, um, the Fed ran reserves to GDP down to 7%. And you can see that on the left axis, the red line is positive at that time. So that indicates some reserve scarcity. Remember from before that from our, from our one first order condition that if R is greater than IOR, since phi is a positive number, that must mean the convenience yield is, po is substantial. Okay, so a positive spread, let's call V prime R minus phi the net convenience yield in reserves. A positive spread means that the net convenience yield is positive. All right, so. In September 19, you can see how the red line is positive. And that was a bit surprising in the sense that if you go to the left back to 2011, when the Fed last had reserves of GDP of 7%, back then there was no indication of reserve scarcity. The spread was negative. Okay, so in uh, the paper with David Lopez Alito, we argue that maybe GDP is not the only thing that could switch, that could sort of shift the demand for reserves. In particular, uh, between 2011 and 2019, the banking sector grew massively. Deposits went up a lot. And so we control for deposit to get a better model of reserve demand and calculate uh, when, when would we expect uh, substantial reserve scarcity uh, given today's deposits. So to do this, I'm just going to estimate that same equation from before. We assume that the convenience yield in reserve is log linear in uh, reserves and in deposits plug that into that first sort of condition we had in yellow. Now we have an estimatable equation. There's lots of discussion in, the, in that paper about whether we should instrument for reserves and deposits. The key thing is to control for deposit because that shifts the reserve demand. It really doesn't change much if you instrument. It is conceptually and in practice important to instrument for reserves. This will also allow me to talk you through a little bit more of the moving parts of the Fed's balance sheet. Okay, so why do we need to instrument for reserves? So I drew the reserve market diagram before. We had the reserve demand. We had the vertical supply. But that was actually not quite right because the supply curve is not always vertical in particular. It, there's a discount window. Right? The Fed stands ready to add more reserves. The banks can borrow reserves from the Fed against collateral in the discount window. So the supply curve actually has a flat part up top. And the, it also has a flat part at the bottom because the Fed stands ready to reduce reserve supply if the market interest rate would have otherwise cleared below a desired level. And so the way to think about it is, if you start uh, from the red parts on the Fed's balance sheet, then reserves are going to be, as a starting point, the amount of the Fed's security holdings minus the part of that that's funded with currency or with the government deposits at the Fed, the TDA. But, so that's in red to the right, but then you have these loans to banks at the discount window or in the new bank term funding program, or you have the ONRP that makes things a little bit more complicated. The key point here for estimation is that when you are on a horizontal part of the supply curve, you can immediately see that demand shocks are going to actually change reserves. 
And so what we do is we instrument reserves with the vertical part with reserves plus one RP. So what comes out of that is that you get, I mean, it works, it works amazingly well in the sense that if you look at the raw data, uh, which you, you, could, you could think of this as basically the, this is the reduced form of, the, of that IV. If you look at the raw data of how does the Fed funds IOR spread relate to reserves plus ONRP supply, you, you, know, you can immediately see that there must be some, some really serious instability in the reserve uh, demand curve. Uh, by contrast to the right, I've changed the x-axis to consolidate the equation as stated in blue to basically define deposit adjust supply. So supply adjusted for the demand shifter. And now you can see that you get a really tight fit. Notice also that the highest predicted spread is precisely in September 2019 uh, at a predicted spread of about four basis points, so some reserve scarcity. I also marked uh, January of this year. You can see we are not as tight. There's still some room before the market will be as tight as then. Now, once we have our estimated equation, we can calculate counterfactual predicted spread for any potential reserve plus ONRP supply given today's deposits. Okay, so plug-in deposits of 17.4 trillion as of January this year, and just trace out the predicted value as a function of reserve plus ONRP. What we get is that a value of reserve plus ONRP of 2.7 trillion would uh, lead to the same amount of reserve scarcity as in September 2019. Of course, that may be more scarcity that you would want if you're an interest rate volatility type person, but here's the number. Uh, just for reference, the actual number currently is 4.1. So by this criteria, there's still some room to go. All right, so now the other, the other um, possible arguments and why they go the other direction. So let me mention three. So if you think about supplying liquidity, you might think, OK, let's just supply a lot of reserves. Like, How could that possibly generate a small optimal balance sheet? And the argument that I'm going to make is that it, it need not, but it does because the Fed has announced its intent to supply reserves by holding treasuries only in the long run. Treasuries themselves are a liquid and safe asset. And so when the Fed decides to have a big balance sheet, not only is it supplying liquidity through reserves, but it's kind of eating you know, safety and liquidity through its treasury holding. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to calculate out a number for that, uh, for that channel, what's optimal for the balance sheet given that channel. Two other arguments for smaller balance sheet is that there's some very good work on side effects of large balance sheet, several papers out of Wharton faculty, basically saying you know, if, the, if the banks have to hold more reserves, then they need to either hold less of something else, and there's evidence that reserves actually crowd out lending to firms, which is obviously bad if banks are special and stuff. You know, or uh, the banks have to uh, hold more liabilities. Now, this could be good in that households love deposits, but that also is a potential driver of financial stability is to issue more short-term liabilities. Finally, central bank profits. Uh, of course, a big threat to central bank independence. So if you want to be ready for the next downturn, it might be good to have a smaller balance sheet in more normal times. OK, so just let me show you one equation to think about that first channel. And I know this whole idea of convenience, you, live, you know, if you're not a monetary eco economist working on this stuff every day, you might say, isn't that kind of an esoteric criteria for setting the size of the Fed's balance sheet? So I want to just remind you that, no, actually, this is like the very basic thing of what central banks usually do. Right? They facilitate payments by supplying money. Money improves welfare. It has a convenience shield. That's why you're holding it despite it not paying interest. Um, we don't focus on that so much day to day because it's supposed to all just kind of run in the background. And we focus more on monetary policy and financial stability. Um, but remember that my first point was that we can do sort of one more thing with the balance sheet. We can control the, the policy stance of the interest rate and reserves. You know, one obvious thing we could do as that extra thing we could do with the balance sheet is to go back to basics and facilitate payments, not only in terms of cash, but in terms of reserves. Okay, so that's the whole idea of this supply and convenience stuff. It's really just going back to basics of what central banking uh, is uh, at its core. So we're going to have a lot of discussion uh, in, in the session today about uh, debt, government debt, I suppose. And you might say, well, and it, there's so much treasury debt out there. Like, how special could it be? 
So let me just give you a number on the latest Treasury Convenience Shield, and then we'll trade off reserve and Treasury Convenience Shield to get to an optimal balance sheet size. So um, this is a picture from a, a, an older paper of mine with Arvind Krishnamurti, where we graph basically a downward sloping demand curve for treasuries. You should think of it as very similar to the reserve demand curve that I derived before, just for treasuries as another safe and liquid asset. Uh, the y-axis is the AAA corporate bond yield minus the uh, treasury yield. I'm graphing that against the supply of treasuries. So it's, it was well known before our work that this spread, this yield spread uh, between the highest rate of corporate bonds and treasuries tends to be quite large. Our thinking was that it's because the spread is not only due to the default risk on the corporate, but also due to some people finding the treasuries to have quote unquote money-like properties and being willing to hold them at a, a pretty low yield. So we did the decomposition to the right, and we made the observation that this treasure convenience shield, like any other convenience shield, should get smaller and smaller when there's more convenience to be held, and that's how the picture comes about. Um, you can see the numbers we estimated for the, from, for the convenience shield, which is the distance to the asymptote, it's substantial uh, in bond market terms. All right, so now if you look at the x-axis, you know, currently we are at about 100% debt to GDP. So based on that, we would say you're already at the asymptote, you know, based on the older regression. However, there has been actually a huge demand shock for treasuries, so treasuries still have a convenience yield. So in the top right picture, I went ahead and added in the data since the financial crisis, and you can see that they are substantially above the asymptote, suggesting that treasuries are still special. And that's because there has been a huge demand shock a positive demand shock uh, for treasuries from the Federal Reserve and from foreigners. I show that in the bottom pictures where the x-axis in the left is uh, adjusting supply for the part of the supply that was sort of eaten by the Fed, and the right checks out both the Fed and the foreigners, getting back to a more stable looking demand curve. So if you think about this in terms of time series charts, the left side here shows the massive increase in the Fed and foreign holdings of treasuries relative to US GDP. And the right side then concludes by, or sort of summarizes this by saying, look, despite the fact that debt to GDP is about 100%, there's only really 50% to be held by other holders. And that's why the treasury convenience yield is still positive. Okay, so in one formula, actually, then we can derive the optimal uh, Fed balance sheet size based on this uh, criterion of convenience supply. To do that, we need that one formula at the top, which in red uh, puts the convenience value from reserves, and in blue, the convenience value from treasuries, so B is treasuries, and the private sector's holdings of treasuries is going to be how many they're supplied in total, minus the central bank's holdings, BCB. Okay, so then we can conceptually distinguish two cases, one in which the Fed decided to fund its balance or to issue, to supply reserves by holding assets other than treasuries that had no convenience yield. That's a simple case, case A. Then you can ignore the blue term and just maximize the red term and you get the first order condition there that says basically the Friedman rule for reserves. Keep supplying reserves until the last unit is, has no value. That's unrealistic for the Fed because we have come out and said we're gonna planning on holding treasuries. So the Fed is really in case B where both terms are relevant. The key is that the two terms are linked. And so that's because, as a simplified version of the Fed's balance sheet, the Fed's treasury holdings are its sub equal, that's an asset, equals its liabilities, which is reserves, plus A is the autonomous factor, sets the cash in the government deposits. So now, if you trade off those two terms, maximize uh, the total convenience pro provided with respect to R, you get a very simple condition that says you should equalize the convenience yield on reserves and the convenience yield on treasuries. So to do that, I estimate out the convenience yield function for treasuries, and then I can just calculate what is the number. Um, so uh, just, for, just so that you can see that it matters whether the Fed is in case A or case B. In case A, where that's perfect. Uh, in case A, where the uh, if the Fed were to supply reserves by holding something inconvenient. Then the optimal balance sheet by this criteria would be about 3.3 trillion. That's not the Fed's plan. So we are in case B. So I go ahead and estimate out the treasury convenience demand function, capturing that demand shift by putting in some annual dummies and assuming that the asymptote is the same as it was before. So the latest convenience yield is about 35 basis points. But more importantly, now I have a whole function. 
All right, so from the first part of my comments, we had estimated the reserve demand, the reserve convenience yield function. Now we have the treasury convenience yield function. So now what we can do is we can equalize the convenience yield and get to the final number. Perfect. So the, the red line is actually the same as you have seen already. It's the, the, the reserve demand as a function of reserve plus ONRP. It looks small because I put it into the same figure as the treasury demand, which is much bigger since m many more people can hold treasuries than reserves. Um, and the A points on the reserve demand of the treasury demand schedules, that's where we would be today if the Fed uh, on the asset side held only treasuries. It's not quite where we are because the Fed still has some MBS, but that's where we would be if it was an all treasuries portfolio. You can immediately see that that can't possibly be optimal. Right, because, at least not from a convenience supply perspective, because this point is negative, right? So the net convenience yield on reserves is negative. So, this, so basically, the Fed is way overdoing the liquidity supply. So not only is this negative, it's much lower than this number here. So in other words, you're supplying something that no one wants, and you're doing it by taking away something that people really want. I mean, that can't be good. So the B points then um, figures out how much to shrink the balance sheet to equalize those two convenience yields. It works out, it's one equation in one unknown. It works out to 600 billion, which you can see is, there's huge standard errors in this. The main point is just that it's quite a lot lower than the other number. The convenience yields equalize at about 30 basis points, which you know is sort of large relative to numbers we have seen in recent years. But let me remind you that the Fed used to not pay interest on reserves. So when, when the nominal rate was 5%, you know, we were at a 500 basis point convenience yield and the world didn't fall apart. The ECB historically operated with about 100 basis point reserve scarcity, you know, and that didn't fall apart, at least not for those reasons, as far as I know. Okay, so uh, last comment I want to make is, what if the Fed were to shorten the maturity of its treasury holdings? If you look at the AAA treasury long maturity spread, it's way higher than the corresponding commercial paper treasury bill spread, saying basically that short maturity bills are a lot less special than long maturity treasuries. In the limit, if bills were not special at all, the Fed would be in case A, making the larger balance sheet optimal, both from an interest rate volatility and from a convenient supply perspective. So let me just leave it there and not run over time too much. All right, thanks a lot for having me. Really excited to be here. Thanks for organizing this conference. Thanks for inviting me. Um, OK, I'm going to, like today's central bankers, I'm going to interpret the mandate I got here broadly. I'm going to talk about uh, the marriage between monetary and fiscal policy. And I'm going to say it's sort of a, an unhappy marriage. And, and, and this is Princeton, so I'm assuming you still read the, the classics here. So. All unhappy families, as you know, are unhappy in their own way. But I'm, I'm going to try and find some, some parallels across countries. I'm going to focus mostly on the US, but not, not exclusively. OK. I have a couple more jokes, but so far my jokes have all fallen flat. So that's slightly <laughs> concerning. But OK, I'll keep going. Um, so uh, what we've seen across advanced economies is that there's been uh, sort of a secular decline in, in growth rates, right, and, and a demographic transition, Dr. Bernanke uh, alluded to. And, and that's kind of a problem for governments in advanced economies. They've made a bunch of promises to transfer recipients, people who get Social Security payments, uh, welfare, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and in the face of all this, uh, they're struggling to keep all these promises. It's, it's very costly for them to default on these promises. I'd say a lot of these promises, if I can use a finance term, are very senior claims. Uh, if you're a politician uh, defaulting on promises you've made to uh, Social Security claimants, it's probably not a good idea. And so uh, I'm going to borrow a phrase here from, from my thesis advisor. What, what we've seen is that countries have shifted the burden to future generations. Um, and so Sargent said, well, it is feasible for one generation to shift costs to subsequent ones. That's what national government debt does. And, and so across the board, if you look at advanced economies, um, over the past couple of decades, you see a secular upper trend um, in debt to GDP ratios. And in a way, that's sort of what you'd expect to see, right? Because, well, Junior can't vote, 
Um, and so effect, in effect, you're sort of sticking junior uh, with uh, the bill. But what usually happens is that the bond market has a say in all this, right? There are what we used to call the bond market vigilantes. They briefly made an appearance in the US towards uh, in the 90s. Um, and what the bond market's supposed to be doing, and this is kind of a natural part of price discovery in the bond market, is they're supposed to say, well, you know, the value of all treasuries is supposed to be backed by future surpluses, right? Future primary surpluses delivered by the federal government in this case. Just like if you take sort of a mortgage-backed security, that's a pool of mortgages. That's a claim to all the payments that are going to be made by people who took out these mortgages. When you're pricing this instrument, you have to think about all these mortgage payments that are going to uh, accrue uh, in the future. Treasuries are just like that. Usually, when we think about pricing treasuries, we just sort of look at the yield curve and think, well, does this roughly have the right shape? But there's a second function of, of treasury markets, which is sort of to make sure that government debt is backed by surpluses. Mm -hmm. um, now, there are things one can do to help the government um, shift the burden to future generations. And, and these are what I would call low rate policies. Auto economists have referred to this as financial repression, but I've noticed that people roll their eyes when I use that term, so I'm going to not use it. But that's broadly what I'm thinking about. Okay? And if you sort of start reading um, a history of uh, financial markets, um, it is shocking how common the use of financial repression was. In particular, every time there was a war, whether it be in the US, the UK, continental Europe, governments have massively resorted to what I would call financial repression. And that actually typically involved things like central banks buying T-bills, bonds, but other things as well, issuing non-marketable debt. And I'd say that one way to interpret what's happened in monetary policy over the past couple of decades uh, is actually to say that some of what's going on is also a recurrence of financial repression. We just don't call it that. Uh, we don't refer to these as low rate policies, but effectively that is what they achieve. And, and sort of case in point there, on the, I hope you can see that on the right hand side, I have a, a chart of the annual purchases of Japanese government bonds, excluding T bills. In red, you see what the Bank of Japan is buying. In green, you see what the banks are doing. And then the yellow stuff, which is smallish, is insurance and pensions. What's the point I'm trying to make there? Well, over the past 10 years, uh, the private sector has been a net seller of Japanese government bonds. And the r only real buyer, uh, and they're crowding out all private buyers, uh, is, is the government. That's an extreme example, obviously. And, and when you look at the yield curve in Japan, you have to be aware that that's essentially uh, a price at which private market participants uh, are not really uh, buying, right? Um, so then one could say that in some cases, maybe that's going to impact the price discovery in, in treasury markets. And maybe that mechanism that I was referring to on the bottom is not working that well. Um, so there's sort of a, a new central banking consensus. It varies a bit across different jurisdictions, but it's particularly true, I think, in the European case where, and this, this sort of um, was uh, illustrated in a very salient way on March 12th when the newly minted president of the European Central Bank was asked a question at a press conference, just to remind you, this was the start of COVID in Europe. She was asked, well, uh, what about those spreads, right? The spread between Italian and German bonds is creeping up. Isn't that a concern? And she said, well, we're not here uh, to close the spreads. This is the function. This is not the function, excuse me, or the mission of the ECB. I read that. I thought, boy, that's a perfect answer. That's exactly right. Uh, that's not what they're supposed to do. But then the response to this was that Lagarde had made a rookie mistake and that this reflected the fact that she's not trained as an economist and lacked experience. So, so there's clearly a new consensus around what central banks ought to do. Uh, because, in some sense, this is clearly a case of a central bank uh, leaving its narrow m price stability mandate behind, I would say, and wandering off into um, fiscal policy in some sense, making sure that peripheral countries can roll over debt. Now, you might say to me, well, Hanno, what are you getting worked up about? So maybe real rates are a bit lower than they would otherwise have been. Big deal. That's true. That's one perspective. But I would argue that we need to think about all this carefully. 
and that we need a lot more work on this. Uh, for one thing, it sure seems to distort incentives of governments. I can tell you that if you tell a Belgian politician, that's where I'm from, we're going to cap the Belgian yields, uh, they're going to think, well, then I'm going to spend a whole lot more. Uh, Politicians respond to incentives. Um, but it's not just that. Uh, you're also engineering transfers of wealth. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. Within generations, um, you're actually imposing a hidden tax on poor or less financially sophisticated households who are stuck saving in deposits for retirement. And transferring wealth to richer households who are more financially sophisticated and hold duration in their portfolio. And they're going to benefit when real rates go down. Of course, there's the transfer across generations. That's the obvious one. Uh, it's good news for governments, typically, because their debt is short duration, uh, but their surpluses are far in the future. So when you lower real rates, that's a windfall for the governments. In the European case, there are also transfers across borders that are significant and really haven't been studied very, very carefully. Uh, you're also potentially distorting incentives of market participants. I would argue that and you're re-engineering the financial system in ways we don't completely understand by incentivizing reaching for yield. And I'll come back to that in a second as well if I have um, time. Okay, so uh, what am I going on about? Well, here's a picture of what happened in the US fiscally over uh, the past two decades or so, starting in 1999. The gray lines are CBO 10-year projections for primary surpluses as a fraction of GDP on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, debt over GDP. So every line starts when, you, when the CBO made the projection. These are not forecasts, to be fair to the CBO. What they do is they look at current law and just roll it forward. They do assume that when Social Security runs out of money, we're going to keep paying. Okay. Interestingly, in 1999, I don't know if you can see this, um, the projection was that the debt to GDP ratio 10 years later would be 6% of GDP. And I remember when I was in grad school, a lot of serious economists were worried about this, thinking, well, maybe we're not going to have a sufficient supply of treasuries in order to have a well-functioning treasury market. That's not what happened, obviously. The actual path is the red line. Looks remarkably different. You're probably thinking, what happened? Are they clueless at the CBO? No, not at all. What happened in most cases is that Congress ex post passed new laws uh, where we either decided to tax less or, as Dr. Bernanke explained, spend a lot more. Uh, in some cases, it's also that the growth rate slowed down a bit. Okay? And so that's why what you see, sort of a remarkable picture where what actually happened is sort of the upper envelope of the debt to GDP projections. Each time we thought, OK, now debt to GDP is going to revert back to some long run mean, but instead it kept drifting up. Remarkably, though, and I think this is sort of what generated the sense of fiscal exuberance before the pandemic, yields kept drifting down. Uh, what I'm plotting on the right hand side here is a measure of the real 10 year bond yield. So I took nominal yields, took out a measure of expected inflation. You can also look at tips. That's the blue line, the 10-year tips yield that I downloaded from Fred. It gives a similar picture. And this generated what I would call fiscal optimism, the notion being, and Dr. Bernanke explained it earlier, well, if we know for sure that forever after R is going to be lower than G, the real rate at which we finance deficits is lower than the growth rate, then we can just keep doing this, and we don't have to run surpluses, right? Okay. Now, I would say that that's kind of a dangerous position to take. For one thing, and we've talked about this a lot throughout today, it's actually very hard to know what the natural equilibrium long run real rate is. You can call it R star. Uh, it's a hard thing to measure. This on the right hand side is the black line, is the R star measure that Laubach and Williams have developed using some sophisticated filtering technique for the US. And, and Dr. Bernanke alluded to this earlier. It sort of was drifting down quite dramatically and sort of settled before the pandemic somewhere around 50 basis points. And you know this, this matters, right? The Fed is in some sense navigating by the stars, because what they do when you ask people on the FOMC is they say, well, 50 basis points, that's where we're headed. And we're just going to add our inflation target of 2%. So in the long run, we're going to converge back 
uh, to this. But I would argue that, and sort of eyeballing this picture, of course, I can't prove that. It's certainly uh, tempting to think, well, actually, maybe you had something to do with this picture. Uh, because certainly around 2008, there's a quite dramatic uh, break, both in Europe and the US, which is exactly when large scale asset purchases started. So that's something to think about. Maybe the stars are moving when the Fed changes course. I can't prove this, but I think it's something to think about. And that's alluded to this. Why were rates so low throughout this period? So the back, the setting here is the US is running ever larger deficits, but yields kept going down. How did that happen? Well, um, there's two large inelastic buyers of US treasuries that have played a tremendous role over the past two decades. The pink stuff is the Fed. The red stuff, I hope you can see it, it's not so clear. The red stuff is the rest of the world. And so before and during the great financial crisis, uh, we got a huge assist from foreigners who were really buying treasuries even throughout the great financial crisis. Um, there was a flight to the safety of US treasuries. Overall, they absorbed about five and a half trillion uh, in terms of issuance. The black line is issuance here. That pattern stopped dramatically in 2020. Foreigners uh, were done buying, and in fact, I think you can see it here, they started to sell uh, a little bit, uh, and instead what happened is that, that the Fed stepped up to the plate and absorbed 5.15 trillion of issuance. Uh, overall, over these 20 years, the Fed has absorbed 30%, foreigners 30%, so together that's about 60%. Okay. These are rather inelastic buyers, especially the Fed, obviously. They're not that price sensitive. And that might contribute to us having seen extremely low rates in spite of the fact that they were running historically large deficits. And so I'm not just shoot shooting from the hip here. I have actually worked on this um, with uh, my co-authors, uh, Zhen Yang Zhang, Stan Van Eeuwerberg, Mindy Zhao Long, and we just found it very hard to make sense of the valuation of treasuries if you compare it to reasonable forecasts of surpluses. And you can do this various different ways. You can use sophisticated econometric techniques to forecast surpluses. You can use CBO projections. You keep coming up short. It's very hard to get to a number like 25 trillion, um, which is consistent with the notion that um, maybe treasuries are overpriced in some fundamental sense, and treasury yields are too low. Um, now you might say to me, Hanno, that's a little bit naive. Surely there are arbitrageurs out there who, if that were the case, would short treasuries. Well, in Japan, they call this the widowmaker trade. Right? Central banks have a huge balance sheet, and they can probably outlast um, your position. So even you might be right on the fundamentals, you might be setting yourself up to lose a lot of money. Let me skip this in the interest of time. How am I doing on time? So, five more minutes? Okay, that's perfect. So, let me walk you through what happened during COVID. And so, I'm going to give a slightly different version of what happened in COVID. Um, I'm going to interpret the reaction of the bond market through a fiscal lens, okay? So, at the start of uh, COVID, March, between March 9th and March 19th, 10 year Treasury yields went up by about 70 basis points. That's huge. Um, but if you think about it, um, let's go back to the price discovery role of treasury markets. The present discounted value of surpluses went way down when COVID started. If you are a sophisticated bond investor, you understand that the government's about to spend $5 trillion. That's what happened, right? An extra one-fifth of GDP, a massive response in the US, much bigger uh, than in most uh, continental European countries. Then treasury yields would have to increase quite dramatically, and that's what happened. So you could sort of say, and this is kind of a, a slightly different take on what happened there, and I'm not denying that there were liquidity issues, by the way, but you could say, well, actually, valuation of treasuries has to come down because we're going to be running much bigger deficits than we anticipated. That was not the Fed's view. The Fed said, well, markets aren't functioning. Um, and so on March 15th, there was a dramatic response, and they said, we're going to uh, purchase treasuries, uh, first 500 billion in treasuries, 200 billion mortgage-backed securities on March 15th. That was the announcement. March 23rd, they, they said, well, it's open-ended. So essentially then you're using the Fed balance sheet to warehouse treasuries. Uh, and, and the interesting thing here is that these are 
four quarter averages, but I think you can see that if you exclude T-bills, that the Fed was actually absorbing more than issuance at the long end. That's quite dramatic. That, that looks like what you see in Japan, right? The private sector is now selling notes and bonds to um, the Fed. Okay. Interestingly, when the Fed said, okay, we're done, no more, in March of 2020, you saw quite a dramatic response in the bond market, right? So if this was just a liquidity problem, then there's two questions. Why did the Fed have to buy all the issuance for a year? And then why did we see this dramatic response in 10-year real yields when they stopped buying? That suggests that maybe, um, maybe real yields were artificially low before, which is consistent with the notion of financial repression. So that brings me to my comment about the unhappy marriage. I think there's sometimes a disconnect, this is certainly true in Europe, much less true here, between what central bankers say and what they actually mean. So for example, you could say, well, I think treasury markets are liquid, but what you really mean could be, I can't prove this obviously, I can't read minds, but it could be that you mean, well, the treasury needs to fund huge deficits because we really have to have a strong fiscal response to the COVID crisis. Certainly in Europe, it's much clearer. The, the ECB will say things like, when spreads are high, sovereign debt markets are segmented. Um, that's kind of a bizarre notion of market segmentation. As a financial economist, I would think that if there were no spreads, that would be evidence of market segmentation because the fiscal situation of Belgium, which is where I'm from, is very different from the fiscal situation of the Netherlands or Finland or Germany. So these bonds should all be priced very differently. They'll say things like, well, transmission of monetary policy is impaired because there are spreads. That, what they really mean, I think, in a lot of these cases is, well, the periphery is potentially in fiscal trouble. And we cannot afford to see any of these countries default. OK. Now, I've, I'm just about out of time, right? Like Maybe two minutes? Or I'm out of time? One, One minute. minute. OK, so let me briefly. So I've talked about the intergenerational transfers. Uh, let me come back to this point about wealth, the wealth distribution briefly. So when you're lowering real rates, by the way, I'm not saying the Fed is responsible for the entire decline in real rates, obviously, right? Um, when real rates go down, and they've gone down arguably unexpectedly by a lot between 80, 1980 and 2020, that pushes up the valuation of long-lived assets because they have high duration. Now, if we all in this room held the same portfolio, that would have no effect on wealth inequality, but we don't. Uh, the richer ones uh, amongst US investors have a lot more duration, and so you see kind of a dramatic correlation between the fraction of wealth owned by the top 10% and what, what I have here, the black line, is a 10-year real bond price, sort of inversely related to real rates. So wealth inequality mechanically goes up when you lower real rates. That's why I said earlier, if you think about sort of the implications for the current generation, it certainly seems like the losers from lower real rates are the young, the poor, and the least financially sophisticated. They have a long horizon. They need to save for retirement because you've got to consume after you retire when you're not earning. Uh, and they don't have enough duration in their portfolio. So when real rates go down, they don't see big capital gains. They're just saving in deposits. OK. Let me skip this uh, and conclude, because I'm out of time. Um, there's a long history of governments resorting to low rate policies, um, because I think it's sort of uh, the least unappealing of a bunch of unappealing policy options. Um, this helps government shift the burden to future generations. It gives the government some extra fiscal capacity. That's nice. Uh, but there are costs, and I think for us economists in the room, uh, we ought to study that more carefully and, and sort of carefully do the math to try and understand how exactly uh, this affects welfare. I think it also ser seriously distorts incentives of some agents, particularly politicians, um, and it arguably also re-engineers the financial system uh, by incentivizing reaching for yield. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you for, uh, for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, so I'm last, so I'm going to be short.
And I'll try to be funny, but I don't guarantee that. Um, given the title of the conference, I thought I would make three points. One concerning um, financial stability, which actually is going to connect to what uh, Annette was discussing earlier. One connecting uh, fiscal policy and the R minus G debate, which is also then going to connect to what uh, Hanno was uh, discussing. And then uh, I'll, f uh, I'll finish with uh, some view about very long-term growth to stick with the long-term title of the conference. So let's start with um, financial stability. So I think one thing that needs to be improved in the US is the stress testing framework. So the prime uh, motivation is the uh, SVB uh, debacle, obviously. But I think it was actually, you could see that even before. So um, changes in financial regulations post GFC gave the government, the Fed in particular, uh, the right to uh, run stress tests. Okay? In theory, they can have two scenarios, kind of bad and very bad. Um, and the question is, what do you do with it? And most of the time, for the past uh, 10, 15 years, what the Fed has done with it is set capital requirements, de facto. So they've used uh, one scenario. Um, so that typically, they are called adverse and severely adverse. They've used one scenario to set capital requirements. You come up with a reasonable recession, and you ask the banks to make sure that in that plausible recession, they would still be healthy enough to lend. And then the other scenario, you just don't do anything with it. Okay. Um, now, there are good reasons to use uh, stress testing to set capital requirements, because uh, it's a bit objective. Uh, it's, uh, it's not a bad way to do it. But you're also wasting a lot of potential information. Okay. Um, and so like the third scenario was essentially it died. Okay. Until uh, after the SVB uh, disaster, uh, it was revived as an exploratory scenario. Okay, well, my point is it should have been exploratory from the get-go. Um, and the question is, what's the value of that? So on the right, you have a picture from a pap recent paper with my colleague at NYU, uh, Cecilia Parlatore, where we uh, essentially write a model that tries to compute the value of running stress tests. And the value is what you learn when you run a stress test and what this new uh, information allows you to do to prevent financial crisis. Okay? And um, so here you have, on the, on the x-axis, it's a measure of how uncertain you are about the risk in the economy. Could be the true volatility of the shocks, or it could be the exposure of the banks to, to these shocks. Uh, on the x-axis is uh, what you gain by running stress tests. So obviously, when there is higher uncertainty, the gains are higher, so the slopes are positive. Um, at the bottom, though, the thing that looks pretty small is uh, all the scenarios, all the stress test uh, design, where all you do is you adjust capital requirements. So you figure out the economy is a bit riskier. Let's move it from 12 to 12 and a half. That's valuable, but not very. It doesn't increase. So this is measured in utility for the typical uh, you know, agent in the economy. So the welfare gains are not that high. Um, and also, they don't really depend on how many scenarios you have. So the circles are under one scenario. Um, the, the cross is under two scenarios. We can choose the other one. So in that world, if all you do is move capital amount from 12 to 12 and a half, A, the value is not super big. And two, yeah, you actually don't need two scenarios to do that. Okay. But then the other curve is when you have what we call intervention. So an intervention is when you act on financial risks, not by raising capital requirements, but by targeting a specific, specific what? Then either a specific bank, or a specific market, or a specific set of instruments. So the typical example would be you locate a risk in, say, commercial real estate. You don't ask banks across the board to raise their capital requirements. You tighten lending standards, LTV ratios, or some or debt to income to that specific market. Okay. Now, this requires information, which is why the st stress tests are now, in that world, the stress testing becomes very valuable. And it's a lot more efficient than moving the capital requirements. Okay. So I think that's what the Fed should have been doing from the get go. And I hope they go back to that. And then, uh, in the spirit of making uh, provocative uh, policy proposals, I also think. It's not obvious to me why the central bank should be in the business of designing stress scenarios. 
Um, there are many things you do in a central bank where you have a lot of specific knowledge that nobody else outside has. That's very true. Bank supervision is definitely one of them. You wouldn't want outsiders to do bank supervision. Designing stress scenario for the microeconomy is the one place where the Fed has zero comparative advantage. Okay? There is no private information there. And you have plenty of, people, plenty of people in uh, macro finance in academia who spend a lot of time thinking about this scenario. So I think it would be a lot more efficient for the Fed to have a panel that would at least review the stress scenario and probably even propose some of them. I think if we had that, I'm pretty sure that we would have had a high interest rate scenario three or four years ago. Because we were all talking about it at our conferences. Um, the other advantage is that it would interfere less with uh, Fed communication. I didn't do anything. Um, because obviously, if a central bank says, I'm going to explore in my stress testing a scenario with high and runaway inflation, that's obviously going to interfere with their communication uh, with respect to inflation targeting and monetary policy. Well, in fact, they, they should be able to do both. One is an exploration, the other one is policy making. Okay. So that's my point about financial stability. I think it matters because in a world where, just to go back to what uh, Annette was showing, in a world where we trade off a little bit of balance sheet size against some interest rate volatility, well, that's OK as long as interest rate volatility doesn't bring down the system. So that's, and the way to avoid that is to have efficient stress tests. Second point is about uh, debt sustainability. So I agree with Hanno that it's very hard to pin down R, and in fact, actually even G to some extent. So you know, we have a lot of uncertainty about these numbers. As of now, if you look around the world, we are very close to R equal G. Okay? Kind of also makes the math easy. If R equal G, so if the long-term interest rate is equal to the long-term growth rate of the economy, then the primary surplus, so the surplus excluding interest payments, the primary surplus that stabilizes the debt to GDP ratio is zero. It's pretty easy, because so it's a good benchmark. So the common wisdom is, well, if we think we're in a world where A is roughly equal to G, then we should make sure that we go some towards a primary surplus of zero. And then we can debate how fast we go there, but there is no debate that we should go there in you know, some finite time, say 10 years. Um, I think that's a bit misleading, because uh, this is like not taking into account the risks. and. Uh, if we've seen over the, just look at the past 10 or 15 years, we had the GFC, then we had COVID in Ukraine. So every 10 years, we get a shock that jumps the debt by 10%. Okay? So you can think of, we live in a world where the Poisson probability of one tenth each year that the jet debt is going to jump at 10 point. And 10 point is actually maybe uh, conservative, actually, a bit more than that. But that's easy. Well, that means that really, you should be running a 1% surplus in peacetime in that world even if R equals G. Okay? So just to highlight that, these are the forecasts versus realized for France, where, because we are doing some work, uh, I know these numbers very well, and you could do the exact forecast. So we had the 2019 forecast that were published literally like three weeks before COVID. And that's, uh, th so this is what they were forecasting for the debt to GDP ratio here. And then this is the uncertainty because of uh, random uh, simulations. So taking into account the fact that other things are random. And, um, this is what actually happened. So this is actually even more than 10%. Okay. Well, COVID was bigger than the other shocks, so maybe we won't have COVID every 10 years. But still, I think that we live in a world where we have big shocks. They, they are not that infrequent. Um, and they do matter for the debt to GDP. Um, this, and of course, tends to um, lead to the exact thing that uh, Ben was discussing earlier, which is the interest payments of our GDP were forecasted to be around one and a half, and now they are to be around two and a half. So that's one point of GDP. That's a lot of money that you can't spend on something else. Okay, so in that world, I would argue that uh, even if you believe R is close to G, then the, the answer is not that the primary surplus should be zero. The answer should be roughly, say, 1%. Because you're not in a world with no risk. And it, history shows that every 10 years or so, we get a big shock, and then we, the, the debt jumps. Um, now, the question is, how do you make that credible? Um, now, we have some priorities. Uh, in today's world, they would probably revolve on the green transition and defense that I don't want to cut. So that means credibility means you have to somehow commit to reduce spending in some other areas. Now, how does that play out in different countries? Um, well, in Europe, 
because we don't really have pure sovereign debt like in the US. We have a mixture of sovereign and municipal debt. Because every government in Europe issues sovereign debt, but it's not controlled the central bank. It's not one balance sheet. And so it's kind of in between. So we had to come up with rules. Um, it has a lot of downsides. But the upside is that we have to be a bit creative about the way we do it. And I think that we are converging towards something that looks like um, a debt break. Now, it has very different names in the UK, in Germany, in France. But at the end of the day, it's something that says, um, at some deep, deep level, perhaps in the Constitution or close to it, we agree that to a framework where you can't just print a budget where you predict a primary deficit forever. Okay. Um, and then we have rules to try to avoid that. The US, uh, instead of like, like a theater, it's like a play. You know, it's perfectly staged. Um, except we always, it's like in the cliffhanger, it's always at 11.59 PM the day before, we agree to raise the debt ceiling. Okay. Except one day it's going to fail. With probability one, if you could be doing like that. Even if the Poisson rate is small, if you wait long enough, there will be one day where we don't agree. And then we have this technical default the next day. Maybe it's a big deal, maybe it's not. Uh, but even if we don't think about that scenario, it's still an extremely inefficient way to think about a debt break. Okay. The week before raising the debt ceiling, uh, spending time at night in Congress to find a short term fix and boost this, this is not the way to do it. So I think it would actually be useful for, for the US to study something like a formal debt break that would alleviate and reduce the shenanigans around the, the debt ceiling debate. Um, last point about long-term growth. That connects to also something that uh, Ben discussed earlier. Um, so things we already know. So demographics, you know, um, clearly there was a big tailwind for the past 100 years. That's not going to be the case going forward. So total growth is going to be um, definitely slower because of weaker demographics. So that's, uh, that's, that's we know for sure. Then the question is, what is, what is there after? If you don't have just the sheer increase of population, okay, that's not going to happen. So what else do we have? Well, we have a better educated po po population or better allocation of people in the economy. Okay. If you look at the US post war, actually, this thing was a big deal. So um, a significant fraction of the growth rate of the US since 1950 comes from a better allocation of talent. Essentially, women and minorities were vastly underrepresented in some uh, high paying jobs in the 50s. And it's been slowly getting better over time. And it's big. It's big. It means that that by itself is going to increase the growth rate of the economy. This is fantastic, but it's a one-off. In a few years, we'll be at the point where it looks more or less uniformly distributed. So that gain is not going to be there anymore. So then what's going to be left is more like the standard textbook where everything is technology. There's still room for education. But again, that also has decreasing returns. So we're going to be arguing about whether technology can, uh, can pick up or whether it's going to be enough. And, and on that, I have a slightly different take from the the usual uh, textbook, which is um, we tend to think of technology as naturally compounding, like growing exponentially over time. And when I look at the long run, that's not really what I see. So uh, this is what we call TFP in economics. So it's a measure of the productivity of the economy, which is not driven by having more machines or a bigger labor force or even a more educated labor force. So it's trying to net out this part and this part. Imperfectly, yeah? so it's you know. Um, but this is my um, attempt to look at the evolution of TFP for the world frontier, which over this period of time of 200 years is the UK and then the US. So this is like the max of TFP in the UK and the US. And to me, what stands out is it doesn't look like an exponential; it just looks like a piecewise linear function. So there was some 19th century trend um, that break somewhere in the 1930s, which has been, of course, called the most innovative decade ever by economic historians, because that's where we have the large scale implementation of electricity and, and even development in pharma and, and uh, chemical uh, processes. And then we uh, break this slow trend to a higher trend. Okay? But that trend is also linear. Okay? It doesn't appear, at least at 
price value, the way I look at it, that doesn't look like an exponential curve. It looks like it's pretty darn linear. Um, so that's a different view of the TFP slowdown, if you prefer. Of course, when you st where you're in an economy, um, you know, which is one, so th this is the level of TFP. So today, we are, our TFP is five times what it used to be in 1930. Um, when you turn that into GDP per capita, you, uh, you leverage technology to have better machines. So that adds another factor of 1.5. So maybe we are like eight times richer per capita than we used to be. But the thing is, at that level here, we are relatively poor. When we start growing, it looked great in percent, starting from this low base. Now, today, I think we are still on the same trend or adding knowledge at the same rate as before. But because we are so much richer, as a fraction of what we already have, it's going to look a bit smaller. So if that's the view, then I don't think we can expect a big pickup uh, in productivity growth going forward. And I don't think the one-offs uh, are going to be uh, repeated. Now, of course, you could argue that it's going to be another break because of AI. And that's possible. And you know that's just the future. So I don't know what's going to happen. But at face value, I don't think we can expect a much uh, bigger boost of productivity growth uh, in the future. Um, and that. I think I'm on time. So thank you very much. Thank you. I know we are running a little late, but still, I think uh, uh, um, we'll use uh, 15 more minutes. Yeah. OK. To I, I know the audience will have a lot of questions for you guys. So, so uh, instead of using my for which I thought that maybe I should just open the floor up in case <laughs> uh, we always run out of time. Yeah. Why don't you just start? We usually, like what economists like to do, we like to consolidate balance sheets back to individuals, the citizens, and so on. So my question was, when we say Fed is holding X, Y, Z, and is holding more, and so on, uh, should we try to consolidate those holdings back on the private banks, and then hence the private households' uh, balance sheets? Uh, there's an implicit assumption that you don't want to do that ahead of the way you were proposing things. And so I'm trying to understand exactly what's your why you would treat it differently. And if you were to consolidate, how would you do that? Uh, yeah, let's collect a, a few more questions. Yeah, Beth. Uh, this is for Hanno. Two questions about the fiscal theory. So the key th equation is that the value of outstanding debt equals the present value of s surpluses. And you're arguing that Fed purchases interfere with that somehow. Two arguments. One is that when the Fed buys treasuries, it creates reserves. And it pays interest on those reserves, which are subtracted from the current surplus. So while there is a change in the maturity structure, there's not really any change in the present value of surpluses from the Fed's purchases. That's point number one. And point number two is that fiscal theory people like John Cochran basically are very, and also we heard earlier from Gabex, uh, tend to say that QE doesn't do much. So that asset purchases don't move interest rates significantly. So how can they be you know, having these big effects that you're describing? Okay. What, what, uh, maybe, uh, are there more? OK, w w maybe we can start this round, yeah. OK, um, do you want me to start, or do you want to Should take I take the, the consolidation? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I mean, if you think back to sort of Ricardian equivalence, like what does it even matter what the Fed's balance sheet looks like? Um, the basic intuition is, you know, you could think about a big balance sheet of the Fed as just a maturity shortening. And that may not have any impact in the sense that if the consolidated government has shorter debt maturity, then if interest rates go up, of course, they have to pay more interest. But on the other hand, the people who own the bonds have more interest income. You can tax them. And that's sort of the, the standard uh, argument. However, you don't get required an equivalence if there's convenience yields. And you also don't get it if taxation is distortionary. So the starting point for my analysis is that the Fed's balance sheet matters because these convenience shields are there, and they are not in sort of the standard um, Ricardian equivalence argument. Um, yeah, so, so let, me, let me take uh, Dr. Renanke's question. So um, as Annette explained, if you, and, and you hinted at this, if you consolidate 
the Fed and the Treasury, then what quantitative easing effectively does is you're sort of buying these bonds and replacing them with bank reserves. So these are um, other government IOUs, but with a much shorter maturity. So you're dramatically shortening the duration of the consolidated government's IOUs. But that is exactly uh, what is needed if you want the consolidated government to benefit from lower rates. Because now, your surpluses are far in the future, but your debt is short duration. So you can boost fiscal capacity by lowering rates. Of course, if you let rates go up, uh, then you're going to destroy fiscal capacity. Uh, Japan is an extreme example of this. Um, you probably are aware that Japan has bought back one GDP of bonds and replaced them with bank reserves. That is why lowering rates in Japan really boosts fiscal capacity, because the consolidated government has a big mismatch between the duration of its liabilities, they're very short, and the actual surpluses that are supposed to back these, which are <laughs> in the distant future. Um, so, so, so. Why doesn't the Treasury just do that on its own to cost minimize? <laughs> why, why doesn't the Treasury. Get the fits, the why treasury, doesn't. The Treasury controls its maturity of issues. Oh, so, so, actually, that's a great question. You're probably more informed about the motives of the Treasury. But when we asked um, officials at the Treasury about maturity choice, it seemed like they're not really thinking about the cost of public debt. Rather, what they have in mind is sort of smooth functioning of treasury markets and ensuring that there's enough, enough depth at different buckets. So I'd, my sense was that they really aren't thinking about it this way. But, um, but I should say, this is not without risk, right? If you dramatically shorten the duration when rates go up, which is what's happening now. By the way, often you'll hear people say central bank losses don't matter. Of course they do, right? What we did by doing QE is we... We, we sort of said, well, we had a fixed rate mortgage, but we're going to shift to what looks more like a floating rate mortgage as taxpayers. And these losses that central banks realized, there was a report of losses by uh, the Bundesbank that came out earlier today. What these losses measure is the cost of doing that, because ex post, we, we shouldn't have shifted from, if you just care about the cost of public debt management to taxpayers, we shouldn't have done that. Uh, that's the other thing that I didn't get to talk about, is that large-scale asset purchases have first-order implications for public debt management, of course. Um, but, the, but the Fed then doesn't really have a mandate to think about that. Um, so that's, that's a tension, I think, that we ought to think more about. If Sorry, I, that was yeah, a long way If I can just add, so I skipped this high piece. Lo and behold, said if you have both different maturities of government debt, like bills and bonds, and you have reserves, then obviously what's optimal is to equalize the convenience yield on all of them. And, and sort of the thing that's a bit subtle is, isn't reser are reserves and bills not kind of all the same because they're both very short maturity? And it turns out that empirically they're not. The convenience yield is different. And there's some nice uh, theory by, I think, Vandava and Davanas, but they basically say that um, when there's not that much treasury bill supply, then the general equilibrium works out such that the banks hold reserves and the money market fund holds the bills. And you sort of, as a difference opens up between uh, the two. But the general optimality con condition is that you should, the consolidated government should equalize the convenience yields on bills, bonds, and reserves to maximize the convenience supply. OK, great. And then one last thing, of course. Uh, the, the central bank could always say, I'm going to stop paying interest on reserves, which some central banks have been moving in that direction, right? And saying, well, I'm only going to pay interest on reserves on the margin. That would be another form of financial repression where you could save, potentially save money, but of course, you're going to implicitly tax depositors at some point, I guess. Or the government could tax bondholders. They could, but, that's pr but, that, but doing it openly is less appealing than imposing a hidden tax, I think. Uh, yeah. <coughs> All right. No, thank you very much for an excellent set of presentations. Um, my question is for Thomas, but for all of the panelists more broadly on just what mix of bank regulation you think works most effectively. So like on the stress testing for SVB, the big problem was that all the deposits held by venture capital um, move so quickly. I mean, a stress test just wouldn't have necessarily caught that. 
Um, or, you know, like a Jamie Dimon has said sort of very frequently that, you know, higher interest rates, you know, were not considered, like forward-looking variables weren't considered. So I guess I work on dozens and dozens of stress tests, and I see some of the flaws. So just when you think about the mix of bank regulation that is most effective um, and, you know, the stress testing, what works, what variables need to be included in it, I w was wondering if you could just share more of your thoughts on, like, this whole idea of an independent panel that would look at these issues. So I think there are two different issues. One is the macro perspective, and then one is the other one is the more like um, safety and soundness at the bank level. I think on the macro perspective, it was pretty darn obvious that you needed to consider, consider high interest rate scenarios. Uh, and that was pretty obvious years ago. Um, so on that one, I, w I would say that if you had done a independent panel of people teaching microfinance in the US in 2021, you would have had on the table a scenario with higher interest rate. That I'm pretty sure. The second question is the speed at which the deposit withdrew. So that's like the measure of the deposit beta. I agree on that one. There is more uncertainty. Um, the distinction between uh, insured and uninsured deposit, and also the size of the deposit and the distribution of the size, like by bank, um, what's the fraction of the total deposit in the bank which is above the FDIC insurance limit? That actually varies a lot across banks. And it turned out that for SVB, it was kind of the perfect storm. They were, you know, checked all the boxes for instability. And you could argue that some of it was hard to forecast. Um, so I'm not saying we would have nailed it perfectly. But high interest rate, then you stress on, uh, on deposit, on the, r the runoff rate of deposit, estimated deposit beta. I think that would have gone a long way. In fact, even the estimate today that we have for deposit beta, they are not very far from historical averages. What happened is more like over between 09 and say two, three years ago, estimates of deposit beta were lower than the historical average. Probably, of course, that had something to do with the ZLB and all of that. Um, but today, the estimate that we have post uh, SVB, they are not very different from the one we had in the 90s and early 2000s before the GFC. So I don't think this was that hard to forecast, essentially. Twitter, OK, that's another factor. Maybe that adds a little bit. But my point is, I think 80% of the mess was forecastable. Thanks so much for your insights. Um, I had a question related to the distributional consequences of a low rates environment. So I was wondering, on the flip side, what would be the distributional consequences of having higher rates? So assuming young people, poor households also tend to be borrowers, and then what a transition from a low to higher rate environment could look like. So that, that's a great question. It's, um, I mean, to a first order approximation, it's symmetric. So given the distribution of duration in the U.S., that's what we looked at. Um, we looked at U.S. households, and, and it's, it's very skewed. Most Americans don't have a lot of duration. By the way, by duration, I mean the sensitivity of the value of your portfolio to, say, a 100 basis point change in interest rates, and sort of imagine the yield curve uh, moving up, in this case, by 100 basis points. And I'm talking about real interest rates. So if you have stocks, bonds, uh, these are all long-lived assets. They're going to go up in value. And the point is that they're, they're sort of held um, mostly by uh, richer, wealthier households in the US. Um, the other thing to consider there is that wealthier Americans have private businesses. And they also tend to go up in value because now you're discounting cash flows at, at a lower rate. Whereas if you're stuck saving in deposits, of course, that's very bad uh, news. Um, I think this is even more so, and we're looking at this now in countries like Germany and Japan, where the deposit to GDP ratio is much higher. And, um, and I've been told that most Germans, for example, wouldn't consider investing in stocks. And they just uh, have, they save in deposits. And I don't know if you've looked at the real return on deposits in the Eurozone, but it's been dramatically negative uh, over the past couple of years. So I think it's even more true. In, in the US. But yeah, so when rates go up, um, the effect is reversed. And that would, that would, if it's unexpected, of course, I'm talking about unexpected increases, and that would uh, 
decrease in equality. So the prediction out of sample would be now that we've, we're seeing a compression in the wealth distribution and inequality has been reduced by the increase in real rates. Um, uh, that's the prediction. Of course, I haven't looked at the data to see whether that's actually happened. But it's almost, it's almost mechanical uh, to, to first order. Uh, of course, then people can adjust their consumption, and then there's sort of more complicated dynamic feedback effects. But that's the way it would work. Uh, thank you. Can I have a question about what do you think of risk premium in your picture? Like, uh, I, I think Dr. Bernanke has r wrote about the channel of money po policy through somehow a uh, risk premium. Mm -hmm. And like, for example, in a, in a low risk I environment, what, what do you think about the risk premium stuff? And probably equity premium, default premium, are they, mm -hmm. like, how do you think about that? Yeah. So in, in what I showed you there, <coughs> we were sort of implicitly thinking of the risk premium as constant. Um, and all of the variation is just driven by the real discount rate, R, uh, holding constant uh, the risk premium. Uh, but you're right, there's a famous paper by Bernanke and Kuttner that shows that when the Fed, let me see if I get this right, uh, unexpectedly lowers rates and loosens that the uh, risk premium seems to decline and that pushes up the valuations. Did I get that right? Okay, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's a, nice paper. <laughs> there's yeah. a really nice paper by Ian Martin in the QJ where he tries yeah. to use S&P 500 stock options to calculate a measure of the risk premium going back to the late 90s. And while there's lots of high frequency variation in the equity premium, it seems to be there's no trend the way that you see in the, in the rates. Yeah, it's, it's a bit surprising, but it seems to be true that you, know, you have like return on stock, return on risk-free asset, and then um, it looks like over the past 20, 30 years, this, the base, like the return on safety, has drifted down a lot and then maybe up a bit recently. But the gap between the stock and surprisingly constant at medium horizon. Uh, yeah, there's another one. Uh, yes. <coughs> uh, just a, a question for Hanno and maybe for Thomas. Um, if you consider the duration of the private equity, if it's positive or negative to the interest rates given the possibility of fix that in large amounts uh, in private equity holdings. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a challenge. So when we did this, that, that's sort of the big challenge is to come up with a duration number for private businesses. Or do you mean narrowly, pri private equity narrowly defined? OK. Yeah, we did. We, we sort of. Um, pooled all the private businesses when we looked at the flow of funds and the survey consumer finances and then tried to come up with a reasonable estimate for duration. I think there's, um, we make a distinction between like your small corner store or grocery store that's not growing very quickly. That, that obviously does not have a lot of duration, right? Um, because the growth is what generates uh, the duration. But then obviously there are, for example, private equity like investments that, that actually have a lot of duration. There's, there's debt, of course, so we take that into account. That pushes in the other direction. You're right, um, because you have to pay more interest when, uh, when rates go up. But, um, but yes, we, we take that into account, yeah. OK, great. Uh, yeah. Thank you, uh, uh, Annette, Hanno, and uh, Thomas, for sharing so many insights, uh, for getting us forward. So this is the last session. I also want to thank Atif and also GRC Center for putting together a wonderful you know, uh, 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 conference. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.